not all island snakes are stranded. Banded sea crate have evolved in a totally different way. To complete his studies on Karnak and Shedao, Xavier is now in New Caledonia. He could have found a more unpleasant place to install his temporary research laboratory, but as he says, snakes have two endearing features. They live in sunny spots and wake up late in the morning. For this research campaign, Xavier is accompanied by Yvonne Inetch, a colleague from the Paris Natural History Museum, and Julie Alatas, a volunteer. Every year they visit the site to make a systematic survey of the banded sea crate, or striped jersey snake, a truly astonishing sea serpent. During the course of evolution, the banded crate left land and learned how to swim. Unlike the tiger snakes and the gloideus, which sleep while they wait for the birds to return, the banded sea crate goes fishing for its supper. The sea serpents are extraordinarily flexible and adapt easily. Their being swimmers gives Xavier an interesting element for comparison in his studies. The snakes find a wide range of responses to enable them to survive in unexpected habitats like this wreck. The warm plating of the old cargo boat is alive with both species of sea crate, yellow and blue. Both enjoy this solarium. It helps them to digest. Their sun lounge never gets too warm for them, and it's not too visible for predators. When they've finished digesting, they slide off, energized to pursue their main activities, molting and reproducing. I caught a snake in this bag. It is a laticode laticodate. This snake is lethal if it bites you. But as it is a friend, I think I'm safe. You can make quite unique jewelry with this. In New Caledonia, the banded sea crate is a celebrity. There's just no way you can avoid seeing it. However, its biology is relatively unknown. Xavier and Yvonne are addressing the basic ecology of banded sea crates. It's impossible to envisage the twists and the turns of evolution if you do not know what a snake eats or where it lives. Their ecological studies start with a census of local population, alternating phases of captures and recaptures. So Xavier and Yvonne continue to mark specimens that they release and hope to recapture them later. This is a curious game that works out well with the banded sea crate. If they manage to recapture a snake they have marked, the place where it's caught will tell them if it's sedentary or moves around a lot. They'll take its measurements to see if it's lost weight or gained weight. 
plausible. The time and circumstances of its capture will give an indication of its lifestyle. You can only see banded sea crates when they're on the beaches. But land travel is only a very small part of their daily life. Once they're in the sea, nobody knows where they go. Back on the beach, they crawl into the brush to hide from the birds of prey as quickly as they can. The marking sessions are followed by field work in the brush near the beach. Snake hunters peer into every nook and cranny and often get surprises. Stop here. Look, this warren has collapsed. I can see an anticondata. I'm going to catch it. There in the crack, can you see? Just put in your hand and catch it. This is a caved-in warren. I've never seen a snake that color. Look at that. Nobody's ever seen one like that before. That's excellent. Extraordinary. Never seen it before, not marked. Yellow. And it's digesting a moray. That color's incredible. It wasn't deep down. I'd love to know what sort of animal lives here. It was with another snake, but I couldn't see what it was. The two scientists use a micro camera to track snakes hiding under the ground. Tell me which way to go. Straight on, now forwards and then down. Then up again, okay. Now straight on. Then you've got to get past a pile of sand. They're so far in, you need 30 centimeters more. Perhaps there are several. It's moving. I think it's a nest of snakes. Look, that's a laticodata. And there's a colubrina as well. You really need confidence when you put your hand down holes that are probably full of poisonous snakes, but the risk seems to be worth it. Yesterday, we didn't know where they were hiding. We thought they might be going there. We saw red ones going in, but we never saw any blue snakes. Xavier and Yvonne's tiny camera has unraveled part of the secret of how banded sea crates behave on land. After a small victory, Xavier is thinking about the next step already. Dusk is the best time for observing Laticodata. This is when the snakes leaving their hiding places to reach the sea cross those returning from fishing, who are going to hide underground. Xavier releases the snakes caught during the day at this cool period. At dusk, great flocks of birds return from the sea Quite obviously, banded sea crates are also active at night, and the scientists continue to capture them. Where are the hooks? Here. By observing the banded sea crates, Xavier's discovered that the warrens belong to the returning birds. It will be very interesting to observe the reactions of the warren owners to their poison-fanged tenants. These seabirds are puffins. Their strange croak means they have come here to breed. They nest in deep warrens dug into the dunes. This is the mating season. I can see a beak. Go in. He kicked me. Did you see? Yeah, with his beak. A bit further. More to the right. Go ahead. Right, there's a snake. 
a blue, a laticodata with a big moray. At the end of the chamber, they're sheltered in the warmth, just right for digesting. His belly's distended. He's just captured a prey. He'll be like that for several days. But that's a bird warren. Yes, because the snakes go all the way in, just where the birds are incubating. It's mating time for the birds, and our female snakes are also ready to lay. Incredible. Yes, the birds and the snakes are going to lay at the same time. It would be interesting to find out if the snakes lay in the warrens and if the birds hatch the snakes' eggs for them. The snakes benefit from the temperature and the shelter. And obviously the snakes don't bother the birds. We should come back in a month or two and check the warrens and find out if there are snakes' eggs among the bird eggs the puffins are hatching. Okay, pull out the camera. Xavier will have to return to confirm his theory that the birds participate in hatching snakes' eggs. The fact that the snakes digest in the warrens is interesting in itself. The next step will be to examine the aquatic life of the striped Jersey snakes, and there's only one way to do that, to take the plunge. This morning, Xavier almost made an exciting observation. When he went diving, he was watched by an extraordinarily rare beast, which had only been encountered in recorded history in 1870 by a naturalist who named it the Phobos kinkus. Xavier did not see the long, curved, pointed teeth of this giant lizard, which was thought to have died out many years ago. It was Ivan Inech, lazing on the beach, who was lucky enough to see this lost treasure. The lizard could not have fallen into better hands. From this anecdote, Xavier and Yvon now know that banded sea crates feed in the sea. As they have found many different species of moray in their stomachs. They prospect the holes in the coral reefs. As they move around, they avoid the morays, which are much too big for them. Obviously, the morays are trying to avoid them too. Sometimes the banded sea crates mysteriously disappear. It's no coincidence that this shark often has snake on the menu. A good reason for leaving. Underwater, Xavier is much less mobile than on land as he has to prospect the infinite maze of the coral reefs. he decides to watch snake hunting. No one has yet discovered how they catch their prey. 
This one swimming back towards the beach has a full belly. It's easy to make him regurgitate his prey, a young dappled moray. The digestive juices have already dissolved the head, an encouraging clue. Like a detective, Xavier files this. He will ask a specialist to identify the moray and fill in the details about how and where it lives. If he can find out where the moray lives, he has a good chance of finding where the snakes go fishing. Handling serpents underwater is a cumbersome and even dangerous business. No more long amorphous tubes. Here, striking fangs are very close to fingers and face. There's no way of knowing where the lethal heads are located in the writhing mass. This hundred-headed gorgon gives Xavier a problem. Later, he told us that he really felt he was in danger. Frightening when you know how phlegmatic he is. This time, he decides not to follow the banded sea crates into the deep water, where they obviously go fishing. With snakes, you have to know when to stop and take a step back. Snake hunters are inspired by the flowing beauty of striped Jersey snakes. This is Time for Thought. <laughs>